Good evening ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Solo React Talk. Tonight I am going to be reacting to a video requested by Lupus Macbeth. It's called Ross's Game Dungeon Rama. Yes, if you want to check out my previous reactions to other Ross's Game Dungeon videos, remember the playlist card will be at the top. Just click on it and you'll be able to access them. Remember that this has been created by Accursed Farms. So if you want to check out that YouTube channel as well as the original video, uh, the links are in the description below. Okay, let's start. Three, two, one, go. Welcome to the Game Dungeon. Last time things got kind of grim, so I wanted to detox with something more positive. So today we're rendezvousing with Rama. Rama is a first-person graphic adventure game. Now before we get too deep into this... Graphic adventure game. I don't think... I don't think I've ever played a graphic adventure game. If I have, then it's been... Like a very, very long time. Like I've forgotten, but I don't think I have. Yeah. Wow. I'm making an executive decision on this episode. This came out in the 90s and was designed for a 4x3 monitor. But every single thing of interest in this game is in widescreen. There are plenty of things I like about old games, but giant oversized HUDs isn't one of them. So here's the HUD. You have your inventory. Yeah, no, definitely it's oversized. I mean, it's everywhere. It's in your face. Wow. Inventory here, a compass showing you which direction you can go, options, and that's it. We're done touring the HUD. So I'm converting this to widescreen. Like so much space has been taken unnecessarily. I, there's even a frame. <laughs> wow. Wow. For the rest of the episode. Wow. So let's talk about Rama. The year is 2200 and a giant alien ship is passing through our solar system. And naturally anything huge in space must be a god. So we've named it Rama, after the Hindu god, because of the obvious resemblance. <laughs> you know, it actually kind of looks like that probe from Star Trek. Not, it wasn't the undiscovered, undiscovered country. What was it? Um, was it Search for Spock? No. Uh, I forgot. I forgot the Star Trek movie I'm thinking about. But, you know, uh, Captain Kirk and his crew went back in time to go look for a whale on earth because a probe of in the 23rd century came by earth scanning the oceans it didn't find any whales uh which i'm thinking were the descendants who created the probe i'm not sure why it was looking for whales on earth but it was looking for them it didn't find them then the probe started activating its um, climate changing weapons and it was about to destroy earth so captain kirk had to go into the past to go look for a specific whale not just any whale i think a sperm whale if i'm not mistaken uh and he had to bring it back uh to or should i say take it forward into the future and uh a probe the probe that was attacking earth looks similar to what we're seeing right now yeah Sorry guys, <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm digressing, Let, let's continue. It has an airlock, so we're flying up there to make contact. And before I show you what's inside, there's something else to get out of the way. This game is based on a book. Rendezvous with Rama was written by science fiction great Arthur C. Clarke. Ah, uh, okay, Arthur C. Clarke. Um, yes, I've read some of his books. But this was like in primary school, um, in the public library at, in, in town. Um, I remember The Sands of Mars, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, the Odyssey, Space Odyssey books, 2001, 2064, 3001. Yeah, I, I think that's... I can't remember. There was another one. I just can't remember the name. But yes, I've read some of uh, the books that you know Arthur C. Clarke has uh, written. So yeah, interesting. So is this game an adaptation of that? No, 
Rama is really an adaptation of Rama 2, written by Arthur C. Clarke and Gentry Lee 16 years later. This game follows that book pretty closely, but exists as sort of an alternate reality of it. Rendezvous with Rama takes place 70 years before Rama 2, which is the second encounter with the alien ship. In the game, it's still the first encounter, but almost everything else is the same. So they are taking parts of the first book in terms of the main body structure of the first book, but they're taking the storyline from the second book into the game. Uh, okay, maybe I'm confusing myself. <laughs> I'm sorry. Confused yet? Well, it keeps going because there were even more books written in this series. Rama, 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 Rama. So we dock onto the alien ship, but you're actually a replacement crew member. So the main team is already set up. You're greeted by Nicole Desjardins, the medical officer. In the book, she's French and African, so naturally she has a plain American accent. Hi, bonjour. I am Nicole Desjardins, the medical officer. Man, that is so fake. I mean, yes, you're having that French, you know, the French language you're speaking about, but then the accent, <laughs> you've exposed yourself, lady. I hope that your shuttle ride over was uneventful. You know, I don't know what's worse, not even trying to have an accent for your foreign character or doing it poorly like in Wolfenstein. But she's pretty. She's very pretty. I am being a little too hard on the game though, because the casting is actually really good for the most part. It follows the book characters almost exactly. Anyway, she greets us and things are kind of drab. I mean, we are inside an alien spaceship and really it looks like it could just be some warehouse. I mean, we have the airlock, of course, some random equipment, lockers, nuclear bomb, a cable lift, computers, as far as first but why do we assume that aliens would create technology totally different from how we have created technology? What if they generally have the same similar lines of design like us humans, you know, when we create our technology on Earth? Why, why is it that movies and some, uh, you know, science fiction novel uh, writers, you know, when they describe alien vessels, they are very alien, very otherworldly, very un just unrecognizable, you know. But I'm just saying that, you know, maybe there are some aliens out there that have made something similar to what we have made. And, you know, it, it would not seem indistinguishable from what humans create. So yeah, it's possible. Impressions go, it's off to a pretty mundane start. So I pick up my inventory and wrist computer from my locker and what's this? A new video message. Yeah, you know, I've been asked before, what's my favorite operating system? Well, it's not when- Whoa. Whoa, whoa, whoa. This is like Windows 2000 or even earlier than that. 98. This is another one of those games that can be held to run in a modern system, so I tried running it emulated first. However, I got lucky and someone created a custom installer for the game since the last time I tried to play this. It's, uh, more stable. So back to the beginning. Now let's see what my video message was. Hello again. Again? Nicole told me that you had arrived. Welcome to Rama. Thanks. Say, would you do me a favor, just a little one? Maybe. I left my cigarette lighter up there in my locker. Would you bring it with you when you come down and leave it at the tent site? I'd really appreciate it. Hey, you Cigarette lighter in space? Oh, okay. So they're smoking out here. You're blonde in the book. Okay, we're going to come back to this in a minute. For now, we need the cigarette lighter. So I find the key to break into her locker. While I'm at it, I break open another one. And because this is a 90s graphic adventure game, I take everything. Sure, I'll take your lighter. I'll take everything you have. You know how Indiana Jones has that famous line, it belongs in a museum? Well, not here. These priceless alien artifacts belong in my pocket. I'm sure the rest of the exploration team will appreciate having me as a replacement. 
Once I'm done looting the lockers, I take a gander at the computer where people have left a bunch of video emails for me. You know, as I see um, Ross Scott playing this game, I'm telling myself I could never do it. <laughs> I could never do it. I mean, really, it just... No, no, guys, I'm sorry. Uh-uh. I want to say almost 10 minutes worth. These are all the characters in the game. I'm gonna come back to this too, because I feel like this intro isn't representative of the game as a whole. So I grab my standard issue Shakespearean actor robot and I'm all set. I am in a phrase entirely at your service. Let's go. We descend the lift at about six frames a second and Rama lights up. Now we get to see what we've been missing. Now this is cool, but I think even this is still a little underwhelming. Whoa. whoa 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 wait a minute isn't this it's not a von braun cylinder it's an o'neill cylinder right yes it's like an o'neill station um how do i explain this i'm not really good at explaining things uh it's like a habitat station right uh that's in the shape of a cylinder, you know, and in the inside, like on the surface of the cylinder, you would have your, uh, your mountains, your features, your features that you'd find on earth or your buildings or stuff like that on it, right on the surface of the cylinder. And this cylinder would also rotate. I don't know if it's clockwise or anti-clockwise and it would create its own artificial gravity that way so people that are on the surface of the cylinder would be feeling i don't know like 1g gravity and you know they would be able to live as if they were living on earth you know um and of course there would be oxygen there would be lighting uh that would light up the entire area so that you see what's going on um and it has to be a very big cylinder it can't be something that's small it has to be a very big cylinder uh, that is able to generate the gravity that's required, that is able to have the oxygen and, you know, the perfect speed for the structure to move in space, you know. So, yeah, I think this is like an O'Neill uh, cylinder, but not a Von Braun. A Von Braun one is more like, you know, have you watched Space Odyssey 2001? Uh, that space station that orbits uh, the Earth, yeah, it's similar to that one. The Von Braun one is similar to that one, but this one is different. Uh, if you've watched The Expanse, uh, the behemoth, it's a space vessel in, in, in The Expanse. Yes, it's exactly like this as well. It's just that, you know, with the behemoth, it had engines and it could fly around and do all those kind of uh, stuff. But mainly... Uh, stations like these are usually uh, stationary, kind of, you know, they don't actually move around. They just stay in one place in particular or orbit a planet. And yeah, like it's just a habitat station. So if you know the expanse, you know what I'm talking about. If you know about uh, the O'Neill cylinder and the Von Braun uh, 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 wheel, not cylinder, but wheel, you know, the Von Braun wheel, then you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Okay. This is interesting. This is very interesting. Oh, yes. And Babylon 5. Yes. Babylon 5 also has an O'Neill um, cylinder. Yes. Babylon 5, the station. Yeah. Guys, if you don't know what I'm talking about, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I, I can't help you. Just know that there are some science fiction television shows that you guys need to catch up on. Babylon 5, The Expanse, and probably also uh, Space Odyssey 2001. You know, just to check out these t different types of space stations. Yeah. Okay, let's continue. Rendezvous with Rama is a famous book, and there have been some nice artist renditions. I think the game could have pushed things a little more. Speaking of the graphics, this is another thing that was bugging me. I watched this intro about 10 times trying to get the game running properly, and I figured out what was bothering me. Rama is huge. 
12 mile diameter, 34 miles long. But look at this spotlight. It lights everything up, regardless of the distance. If they wanted to sell me on the size, they should have had the spotlight get bigger as the ship gets closer. Uh, that is just an oversight. That is just an oversight. I'll forgive them for that. <laughs> Even for 96, they should have known better. Anyway, we make it to base camp. There's nothing in the fridge worth taking. Yet. The lockers are more secure here and I can't break into them. So off we go to explore Rama. One of the first things you can encounter are biots. Robots that have biological components. Now you'd be tempted to call these cyborgs, but they're definitely more robot than living. Like almost everything on Rama, their purpose is unknown. They mostly go picking up trash. Or dropping it. I think they're trying to recreate, uh, you know, an ecosystem that you would find on any planet that uh, harbors life. You know, you'll have the creatures that eat plants, that poop out their feces, and that feces creates, uh, is like a fertilizer for other plants to grow, and the very same insects or animals are eaten by other animals. You know, the circle of life. Yeah, essentially these machines, yeah, are trying to recreate the circle of life. Yeah. <laughs> My artifact now. Rama isn't particularly engaging visually. It's mostly flat metal with a bunch of dirt mounds. I think it's incomplete. Uh, when the aliens, uh, you know, transported this Rama station to Earth, they probably brought it here incomplete because there should be like trees and grass and little towns here and there or something yeah but it is quite mysterious what does this do what about this why is this on display this looks like the big gun from quake 2 now this one's obvious first you take your space cucumber insert it into the cucumber apparatus here then turn the dial and hit some of these buttons and you're done could it be clearer the gameplay is a lot like Myst, which is both okay and very bad. You wander around an environment you don't understand. Sometimes there are puzzles you do understand, a lot of them you don't, and it's so damn easy to get disoriented. Later on, this city part is the worst. How do I- Like, the, 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 the movement, you know, like, ugh, I, I can't play this game. <laughs> I can't. I'm sorry. I get over here do i go left straight do a 180 then go right it's absolute madness trying to navigate this i miss key areas more than once also here i solve a puzzle and i hear a click what the hell did that do now i have to scour the entire region again to see if anything changed and if i notice a difference the game is littered with crap like this I like the puzzles that are direct, but the rest of this is basically everything I dislike about old graphic adventure games. I'm pretty sure we're making this game harder on ourselves than actual aliens would. So the graphics are so-so, the gameplay can be a showstopper, so what's good about the game? I'll tell you what, the music. The music to this game is phenomenal. It absolutely nails this mostly benevolent, but still alien feel. Yeah, I like it too. I do like it too. Yeah, it reminds me of some sci-fi uh, TV shows I used to watch um, with this type of music. Yeah, it's good. It sets the tone for the entire game, and I think it wouldn't be half as good without it. I think I need to find it, especially that soundtrack. It's in a very different tone, but this is some of the best alien music I've heard since Super Metroid or Axiom Verge. Except it's much more positive sounding. It's easily one of my all-time favorite soundtracks. Now I can understand if this isn't to everyone's taste, since I guess it's sort of new age. I'm not exactly sure what genre this is, but if- I, I don't know either, you know? <laughs> I don't know, I just know it, I just recognize the sounds you know, from other science fiction 
uh, television show, especially like the low budgeted television shows, not the higher ones, or maybe even something closer, just like, um, uh, what was it called again? Andromeda, Andromeda Ascendant. It had music similar to this. The Outer Limits also had something similar to this. Um, which other one? Oh man, there's so many, but I can't put my finger on it. But yes, you, you get the idea. Some of these soundtracks, I've heard them something similar to it before. So yes, I really do like this genre of music, though I don't know what it is. Yeah. <laughs> Listening to this doesn't calm you down, at least a little bit. It does. And that's one of the main reasons why I like it, you know. Uh, there are even some videos on YouTube where people, you know, are being massaged. Uh, like those massage kind of videos. I don't know why do I like watching those videos, but I do for some reason. Um, they use music like this as well. You know, when they're uh, showing the video of, you know, someone being massaged. And then, you know, they, they're being put on the oil and everything on the face or on the body. And then you'd hear music like this. I don't know. It's kind of relaxing. I don't know. Guys, I'm exposing myself out here. <laughs> I think I should just keep quiet. <laughs> You don't need to know that I actually like watching those on YouTube uh, videos on YouTube. Yeah, sorry about that. You might need some sort of medication, but there's more to the music story than what you're hearing. This game predates MP3, so the original quality is awful. It's 22 kilohertz, mono, compressed all to hell. Considering just how nice it is, I thought it was a crime against music putting it out so low with no soundtrack available. Well, Alistair from Sierra Music Central managed to hunt down the composer, Chuck Barth, and wrangle the original soundtrack from him at CD quality. Amazing. I'm impressed because I tried to do the same thing several years ago, but I wasn't able to find it. But I literally ended up getting the soundtrack from a guy who knew a guy who knew the composer. Now Sierra Music Central was planning on having an official release of this, but that was years ago and nothing's happened. So I'm taking matters into my own hands and releasing this on my own until further notice. This music is just too good to be locked away forever. So if you like what you're hearing, Check out the YouTube description and you can download the original high quality copy for free. Thank you, Ross. Thank you. At the time of this video, this copy is going to sound better than any other version you can find on the internet. Better 20 years late than never. Does this look like the phaser from Star Trek The Next Generation to you? Oh, wow. It actually kind of does. Yeah. Hmm. It does to me. Nope, it's just a spoon. What? Uh, okay. <laughs> so most of Rama is exploring a gigantic alien vessel and solving puzzles and puzzles. But there's more to it than that. And now let's get back to the intro. You're introduced to almost every character right away while they try to give you some of their life story. Did you know that if you take the number 41 and add first two, then four, then six, to obtain the sequence of 41, 43, 47, 53, etc., that the first 40 numbers are all primes and no other similar sequence of that length exists. <laughs> ha! I feel this is a little misrepresentative since the vast majority of the time you're wandering around by yourself solving puzzles, not talking to anyone. Every once in a while, somebody will show up, but it's brief. Oh, I would help you out, but gotta go. Okay, bye. Hey, me again. Bye. Even these small appearances are nice, though, since one of the things I never liked about Mist clones is they tend to be desolate, and you start feeling lonely playing games like this. Brown and Wakefield think we are going to capture an alien. Yes, really. Can you imagine it? 
I just hope the Ramans or whoever created this damn place don't decide to capture us instead. I'm kind of liking these actors here. I'm liking them. Yeah. Yeah, see, everybody dies after this point. Well, not really, but back to the intro. While they are extremely faithful to the book, I think these people might be the most implausible thing about this entire story. I'm not sure I consider them astronaut material. In the future, we have the International Space Agency, but getting to space is still a pretty big deal. It's not like booking a flight. I think the book said they've been training 10 months for this mission. So in the game, not only is this our first contact with evidence of extraterrestrial life, but it's a huge first contact. Even in the book, it's still only the second encounter and we don't know a whole lot. So you'd think we would send the absolute best mankind has to offer. Maybe I'm biased, but I've always thought of astronauts as some of the most well-rounded people on the planet. They need to be smart, brave, and be in fantastic physical and mental condition since there's no end to the amount of stress they may have to endure. If there are any astronauts or cosmonauts in the audience, feel free to set the record straight. So not only do they need to survive the trip, but we have one shot at this. So we better make sure these people are the best we have to work with. So let's play a game here. I'm going to go down the roster and give these people a passing or failing grade on whether or not I think they have what it takes to be an astronaut for the most important space mission in the history of humanity. Uh-oh. First up, Richard Wakefield. A genius engineer, and in the book, he's the smartest person on the whole team. But, hmm... I can't... <laughs> I already know what he's gonna say. I already know. I can't tell for sure through that jumpsuit, but he looks like he might have a few extra pounds there. Now, these numbers will probably be different in 180 years, but right now, it costs about $12,300 for every pound we send up into space. And guys, he's telling the truth here. Like, it's expensive to head into space. You need to be very light. You know, you can't have a lot of weight on you. You know, I think there's like a threshold of how much you should weigh uh, so that they can conserve, uh, you know, like rocket fuel when they're launching into space because they're not only launching you, but they're launching everybody else who's also in the ship and everything else that's uh, in the, the, the spacecraft, you know. So, yeah, it's just the truth. That pudge is expensive. Now, money should be no object for a mission such as this, but in the book, it's also mentioned that he doesn't like to exercise. Well, that attitude is not going to get you into space. Sorry, Richard, I'm failing you. Next, we have Dr. Shigeru Takagishi. In the book, he is the premier expert on the original Rama spacecraft. Except, whoops, in the game, this is the original. Still, he seems fit, intelligent, works well with others. Except, he has a major heart condition that causes irregular beats and even micro heart attacks. Well, that's no good. We can't have that in space. Sorry, buddy. Fail. David Brown. This guy looks fit and his pattern baldness would help his aerodynamics, but he engages in extremely petty power struggles, falsified some of his academic accomplishments by stealing his colleagues' work, and is just passive-aggressive all around. Ah, this guy must have pushed, you know, the people who organized the space travel, you know, we must have pushed them, twisted some arms, uh, bought off some officials probably to get here and he's here this guy would never pass psychological testing fail Nicole Desjardins she's a medical doctor has an even temperament is fluent in at least four languages maybe more and was an Olympic finalist uh yes congratulations you get so you see like the linguistic uh, officer is she going to be communicating with the aliens, probably? Get to be an astronaut. Otto Heilman. He looks a little on the old side, but seems relatively fit. Now, John Glenn was the oldest person ever to go into space at 77. But he was fit and healthy his whole life. Didn't drink or smoke. 
Meanwhile, Otto here has a stogie in his mouth for half his screen time. We're not sending a heavy smoker into space when we have billions of people to choose from, dumbass. Plus, you don't have an indispensable skill. You're just a security advisor. Fail. Irina Turgenev, a career cosmonaut, highly experienced pilot, stays focused on her objective, but looks like she could lose a few pounds for space. Tough call. I have no husband, no children, no life outside the ISA. My work is my life. And now I am to be part of the most important mission humans have ever undertaken. But I wouldn't trade my position with any other woman in the world. Okay, I'll let her slide. Pass. I wouldn't still, because of the weight. I mean, yes, you can say all of these things, which I wholeheartedly agree with. But if we're going to say no to that first guy, we should say no to her as well. We should be fair. We should be fair. Um, yeah. She's nice, but the weight. Michael O'Toole, you're a nice guy, but you're too old and fat for space. Get out of here. Reggie Wilson. Well, he's obviously fit and seems friendly enough, although in the book, he's actually super belligerent because he got burned by some love triangle. However, that doesn't seem to carry over to the game, but he is giving me some weird vibes. And listen. Give me a call if you want to share a beer or two. It could be pretty damn lonely up here. A beer in space? Man, you guys are weird. Smoking? Beer? Huh. I'm sorry, you're feeling lonely on a crew of 12 on the most important expedition ever for mankind? If I was up there, I would be spending every waking moment documenting everything I could. I would worry about unwinding after the mission was over. True. Also, I guess the ISA is cool with sending beer on the mission like a bunch of space dwarves. I mean, what's the worst that could happen if an astronaut got drunk anyway? So I'm not sure I approve, but I can't find any concrete reason to eject him. If the space agency says he's okay, I guess he's okay. Pass. And finally, Francesca Sabatini. You remember her. She wanted me to go get her cigarette lighter because that's the kind of team we're running here. We're going to an alien interstellar spaceship with its own contained atmosphere and ecosystem so we can smoke cigarettes inside it. Why don't we get a little drunk and have some target practice so we can leave beer cans and bullet casings on the ground while we're at it. Then the aliens will have a more complete picture of mankind. Now in the book, she smuggles cigarettes inside the lining of her spacesuit but here she's asking you, as the new guy, to go fetch the lighter for her, leaving a video log of it, no less. She doesn't care. Now, I'd say- The audacity. Hey, this would be more than enough to kick her off the team. But let's keep going. Remember that love triangle I mentioned? Well, in the book, she sleeps with both Wilson and Brown. The game doesn't mention that, but it definitely alludes to it. Accomplished, then we have resources. In a minute. And of course, relationship drama is exactly what we want on a long, important space mission. And to top it all off, she's a psychopath. Literally, she is. It's not so obvious from the game, but it couldn't be clearer in the book. So not only do you fail my test, but you fail every single metric for being an astronaut. What are we doing? She must have also twisted arms and paid off some politicians for her to be admitted. Yeah. Also, as a side note, Rama was this actress's final performance. She's still alive, but she did this role and decided that's it. I'm not acting anymore. Why? Oh, and if you're a fan of the game Blood, you can say hello to the voice of Caleb here. I'm sure he's about how you envisioned him. So this is our dream team of astronauts. Ha ha ha! Ha Plus me. And my character's obviously a kleptomaniac. I shouldn't be allowed in space either. This is really the weakness of the story. 
that our team is somewhere between actual astronauts and reality television. I don't know. I just don't think they're astronaut material. And their performance in the story only reinforces that view. So going by our team, humanity is a lost cause. But hey, that's only half the story, isn't it? This is an alien ship. So are we going to see some aliens? Hell yes, we are. That's the biggest difference between Rendezvous with Rama and Rama 2. In Rendezvous with Rama, the original, more competent team encountered the Biots, but that was about it. It was just a weird ship, and we're left wondering what the hell is going on. Well here, not only do we have close encounters, but the game takes it a step further, and we discover a museum showing artifacts from multiple species as learning aids. Considering just how much the Raman seem to know about us, this is actually kind of disturbing. They not only know that rock guitars are a cornerstone of civilization, but they also have a model of our future spaceships, so their information is recent. It's like they're standing behind you right now. So let's see the first alien, the Avians. I guess this isn't much of a surprise since they're on the box cover, but you can pretend you're impressed. I still don't really know what's going on here though, since we have male and female genders on display. That's pretty easy to follow, but the Avians have bird things and caterpillar things and sentient egg things. What? This can't be their life cycle because then we would have shown a child or a fetus on the human display. The caterpillar things are the more intelligent ones. Do they metamorphosize? <laughs> Kneel before your new god. Also, look at Earth. It shows obvious flight paths we use, but what's going on with these other planets? Do they- I think those are- Do they have teleporters? Wait, wait. No, I'm lost. <laughs> We're all underground, or what is this? Hello! I will say though, out of all the species, we have the best video games. I mean, look at this. This is pathetic. So, okay. So basically, Rama is just a... A spacefaring museum. You know, they just collect specimens, collect the things they've created, you know, and then bring them aboard the station and then exhibit them, you know, for future people who want to visit this ship yeah probably something like that yeah and apparently holographic games are more popular in 2200 but i don't know i'm betting virtual reality will win out over those i don't know if you can handle seeing the other alien race yet use your imagination for now they're more intelligent than us too so watch out i'll save them for later but what about the ramans themselves well that's one of the mysteries of rama we never see them. However, seeing as how all these robots and structures and bad dream faces have three eyes on everything, I think it's safe to assume they have three eyes, and they're probably green. But who knows beyond that? Nah, I think that these are just the creations, uh, like the artificial creations of uh, the Rama species, you know? Uh, these are their versions of robots. And like with ours, we try to make our robots look similar to how we look like. Uh, maybe the Ramas don't want that for their robots. Maybe they just want them to be functional, to be uh, able to do multitasking of various types of things. So maybe they don't look like how their creators look like. Maybe they just purely meant for function purposes. Yeah. Their robots aren't very smart. In fact, we have better AI now than these things have. The Ramans do have robot sharks though, so don't underestimate them. In fact, that seems to be the theme of the Ramans, that they are so, so far ahead of not just us, but all these other alien races too. It only leaves questions as to what's going on. Like the most obvious explanation is that this ship is intended as a foreign exchange program between different sentient life forms. But things are so cryptic you can't really be sure of anything. I said it in the Helios episode, I'll say it again. When you're talking about aliens, you can't assume anything. I mean, what's going on here, huh? Never mind, you shouldn't see this. Again, the Ramans already know all about us. 
In fact, they know so much, they're going out of their way to teach us alien math. Now, in the book, the Ramans had created half-assed replicas of the equipment of the original Rama crew. But in the game, this is the first encounter, and they still know everything. Now, you might think that's just a narrative shortcut, but I'm considering this game canon. You know why? Because Arthur C. Clarke is in it! He doesn't get a lot of screen time. He mostly just shows up to tell you you're an idiot when you get yourself killed. Tut tut, I must say, I'm surprised to see you. I thought we made it absolutely clear that these spider biots are dangerous. This is a Sierra game, so of course they're going to kill you a few times playing this. Man. They give them the full treatment though, since even though this game is only two CDs, they devoted an extra third CD to just interview snippets recorded in a nasty, low resolution, half interlaced format. You know how when a monitor says it's 1080p? Well, that P stands for progressive scan, which means not this. I'll use some editing magic to make this more bearable. Anyway, these snippets are interesting. One of my favorite, well done. favorite parts is that they ask him what aliens might think of us. And he says because we're sending out TV signals into space, and it may not be obvious to aliens what's fiction and what's real, then it's pretty good proof there are no spacefaring aliens that can reach us within 50 light years. Because otherwise, the space cops will be here by now to arrest all of us. The cops would be here already with their sirens screaming right across the radio spectrum. You know, I think he might have a point there. <laughs> he might have a point there. If they saw what we are... You know, showing on our television sets, like, honestly, they would be like, these people are crazy. This entire planet needs to be controlled, needs to be uh, purged, probably, because uh, the species are just so dangerous and unpredictable. I guess uh, it's going to take a long time to get to Mars. Uh... Yeah. There may have been visitors here on Earth in the remote past. Unfortunately nonsensical books and fraudulent books by people I won't mention because the lawyers might be on Ooh, burn. have made it difficult for serious scientists and researchers to, you know, to look into this. Uh, let me make one thing perfectly clear. I don't believe there have been any contact with extraterrestrials in, in the last few hundred years. We have to go back much further than that. But it may be tomorrow. I'm quite prepared This was to 96, be. people. I think, that's, I, I think that's perfectly possible. But it's more likely to be in 10, 100 years. Oh. Speaking of Rama extras, there have been efforts to make Rama into a movie since the 70s, but it keeps ending up in development hell. One studio even modeled the exterior of the ship for filming, but it never went anywhere. But hey, if you've ever seen Star Trek 4, they reused that same pro Yes! Yes! Uh, me, me, me and Russ Scott were thinking alike, yes, this is what I'm talking about uh, with the Star Trek uh, movie, yes. Ah, thank you. Prop as the probe that comes from deep space. That was supposed to be Rama. I guess they decided better to repurpose it for Star Trek than have it go to waste. We're all bloody wetland. Okay, it's alien time. The first aliens you really encounter are the avians. They welcome you into their lair and share psychedelic melons with you so you can all trip out together. As you may have guessed, this species is less intelligent than humans. Even though the navigation continues to be god-awful, I do like going deeper and deeper into their lair here. That's the thing about Rama. It keeps going and you start to feel like you're entering another world. And now we get to the serious aliens, the Octo Spiders. I don't know why they're called this since they don't really resemble spiders at all. They're completely deaf and communicate entirely through color transmissions. You ready for this? Behold! Now these are some aliens, huh? That's scary. Remember, these things are smarter than you, so no sudden movements. These things are just so bizarre, but believable at the same time. If we ever have first contact and they're not here to exterminate us, it might be something like this. This could shatter your world view a little bit. He-Man lied. We are not the masters of the universe. We are just side attractions to the glorious nightmare-like octoped being empire. 
These things are sort of the climax of the story for me, since you're so deep into the game when you finally encounter them. Uh, is this a baby? <laughs> a baby version of them? They have a creepy museum room also where they have photos of other ramen attractions. They've been watching us. Here they have an avian on display. They have a now dead astronaut stuffed and mounted. And oh my god, what are they doing? There are many secrets here we may not want to know. And once again, I want to emphasize the Octo Spiders are just passengers like us. They didn't build this. We are so not special in the universe, guys. So after the Octo Spiders, there's not much left. But the gameplay twists the knife by not only having multiple random puzzle generators that you have to solve every single time you pass through various rooms, but hey! You're now timed on all of this. Because guess what? Humanity has decided Rama needs to be nuked because we don't understand it. This timer is a pain in the ass. Yeah, humans gonna do what humans know best. If you don't understand it, nuke it just in case. Sometimes the clock moves in real time, which would be fine, but if you wander down some hallways, you may lose hours in just a few seconds. Now, if you go the easy route and you rely on the rest of your crew to take care of the situation, this is what happens. Yeah, I'm really not surprised. Thanks for getting my back there, guys. Especially since you caused all this in the first place. But if you essentially cheat and follow a walkthrough, because seriously, this gameplay at the end is terrible, then you can defuse the bomb and... Yeah... Okay, how about we try that again? You defuse the bomb and... Ta-da! Triumphant music? Rama puts on a light show for us, and Arthur C. Clarke stops by again to put us back in our place, to make sure our success doesn't go to our heads. Not bad, but a couple of hours work. It was more than a couple hours. Okay, awards time. Game of Enlightenment. Between the music and the puzzles that don't suck, your mind feels expanded after playing this game. Rama is the future we should be striving towards. In Buddhism, they have the path to enlightenment. I don't pretend to know how that works, but I can imagine you come a little closer after playing a game like this. Reality TV astronauts. I can't get over how dysfunctional these astronauts are. You can probably thank co-author Gentry Lee for that. And uh, reality TV astronauts, okay, that's actually funny. <laughs> Finally, an FMV game that doesn't suck. Full motion video games are notorious for being cheesy and stupid, and this game is anything but that. While the gameplay does not hold up, the I still wouldn't play it. The performances were all fine, and it leaves a positive lasting impression. This is not plumbers don't wear ties. And that's Rama. This is a very flawed game, but it accomplishes some great things too, and the music helps save it. The game honestly feels incomplete without reading Rama 2, but that also feels incomplete without playing the game. Rama is a unique experience. A lot of games are science fantasy, which are designed just to look cool. Rama is science fiction, and is one of the most plausible scenarios for extraterrestrial contact. It's not custom tailored for your amusement. Its mysteries feel real. One of my favorite games is Super Metroid, and what I love about it is that it feels like you're going deeper and deeper into a completely alien world. Rama does the same thing, just in a very different way, and it's rare for a game to provoke genuine wonder in me the way this one does. I think the story is actually a little dry, but some of the ideas that come out of it are just amazing. Okay, that's about it. Oh wait, I'm sorry, Morgan Freeman wanted to say something. Here he is. I know a good script when I read it. I certainly know a good story when I read it. Our Rendezvous with Rama was one of the best science fiction books ever. Well, there you go. I guess I should have let him talk first and saved us all 30 minutes. Oops.
And as my friend Larry Niven once said, the reason why the dinosaurs became extinct was because they didn't have a space program. Damn straight. Oh, guys, yeah, this was very enjoyable. This was really enjoyable. Ross's Game Dungeon, Rama. Uh, thank you, Lupus Macbeth, for requesting that I should react to this video. It's been very enjoyable. Um, yeah, I really do like the premise of the game, you know. Uh, the aliens uh, building such a spacecraft and, you know, having it travel from planet to planet, collecting specimens, collecting... Uh, trinkets from the various civilizations, uh, putting them on display in some sort of like a museum. You know, the, the entire station is a museum uh, where these things are kept. And humans uh, who have been selected by the ISA um, have come there investigating what's going on. And also as a precautionary measure, they have put a bomb on the station, you know, for it to blow up once they've completed their uh, investigation of the station or the ship and yeah it's it's interesting it's an interesting story would it work in a movie or a tv series maybe uh maybe it would have worked in the early 2000s you know when science fiction TV shows uh, had a bit more risk about them, you know. Uh, many of the TV shows that I watched in the early 2000s are totally different compared to the sci-fi television shows of today, you know. Uh, and yeah, I don't think it would have worked out, maybe, you know, with our day and age people, but if it did occur in the early 2000s, it could have really maybe maybe it would have worked maybe it would have worked yeah but yeah guys this was an interesting game interesting game will i play it no <laughs> like i've said before i would never play such a game like this it's it's fun to watch other people play it and talk about it but me no i'm sorry <laughs> i don't have the patience um but guys yeah that's it for tonight uh with uh, Ross's Game Dungeon with Accursed Farms. Remember, if you want to check out the original video as well as Accursed Farms YouTube channel, the links are in the description below. If you like my reaction, please give me a like, comment, and subscribe to my channel. Click on the notification bell if you want to be up to date with my latest videos. And I'll see you guys next time. Okay? Good night. <laughs>